scheme. And um, in fact, the scheme is, uh, is nice in that you can actually construct a different public encryption scheme. If you look at the structure of the scheme, you can actually construct a different public encryption scheme out of it. And that is the, what, what I call the dual regif or the GPV encryption scheme. Uh, so let's look at regifs uh, encryption, right? The uh, secret key is a vector in ZQ to the N. Uh, the public key is a matrix together with an LWE sample. Um, and the encryption is, uh, is this vector R times A together with, uh, you know, uh, the message um, um, masked by R, R, R in the product. Okay. The observation is that you can take part of the cipher types. You can, you can switch between uh, the public key and the ciphertext, in the sense that you can take part of the ciphertext and put it in the public key, part of the public key and put it in the ciphertext, and that gives you a totally different uh, uh, encryption scheme. Okay, in particular, the way it works is this. Uh, the secret key now is not uh, an LWE secret. It is a vector R in 0, 1 to the M, which is exactly the vector R that we chose in the encryption. Right? The public key is A together with R times A, and the R times say the, the, the component of the public key looks exactly like uh, you know what you have in the encryption. The encryption uh, is AS plus E, which is uh, you know I just switched the uh, public key and the and the ciphertext here, and uh, it also consists of B in a product with S uh, plus an error plus uh, the message times Q over two as before. Okay, so really what I did here was I uh, uh, took the ciphertext and the secret key. And I kind of switched the roles of, uh, essentially switched the roles of the ciphertext and the secret key. Okay. Uh, so why does this work? Well, uh, the same reason as uh, as why Rage works. Uh, to decrypt, I'm going to take this guy, multiply it by R on the left. So I get R times A times S plus an error. B in the product with S is also R times A times S, right? So I can cancel. If I subtract the two of these uh, guys, that cancels out. And what I'm left with is this guy z times q over 2 plus a small error. It's this small error plus whatever accumulates from uh, uh, from uh, decryption. Okay, so, so so again, what I do the same thing as before. I look at this number and I say, you know, is it close to q over 2 or is it, is it close to 0? Okay, and that. So this is a different public encryption scheme. So I, I give you, you know, two schemes for the price of one, right? I mean, two different schemes uh, under the same, uh, same assumption. Why, why consider two different schemes? Right? Why, why aren't you happy? Why, why am I not happy with just one scheme? The thing is that these schemes have uh, slightly different properties, okay, which makes them useful in different situations. In Dragev's uh, encryption scheme, the public key is um, a vector A times S plus E. Right? And it turns out that this is um, that if you, uh, if you look at the distribution of the public key, Right, so the set of all A times S plus E, uh, it is a sparse set in the sense that met, there are many vectors in the space Z Q to the M, which don't, uh, which, which you cannot write as uh, A times, sorry, which you cannot write as A times S plus E. Okay. In other words, if I pick a random vector, it is very likely that it's not a valid public key for regular encryption scheme. On the other hand, uh, in this scheme, the dual drug encryption scheme, the public key turns out to be a, a dense set. And that's because, uh, it's essentially because of the Lattorash lemma, right? I mean, so what Lattorash lemma says is that if I do, if I multiply R times A for a large enough R, right? I mean, for R with large enough dimension, the output is uniformly random. R times A is uniformly random. In other words, if I pick a, an arbitrary vector in space, it is very likely that there is an R such that R times A is equal to this vector. So every vector in space is a possible public key. Okay? So the space of public keys is dense. And this, in fact, turns out to be useful uh, to convert this scheme into uh, an identity-based encryption scheme. Okay? So it turns out that you can take the scheme and you can uh, sort of add another layer on top of it. Of, you know, going from identity to secret key, and that's a new sort of algorithm that we need to add. And once you do this, you get an identity-based encryption scheme. Okay, so that's a nice uh, property of uh, of this encryption scheme. So uh, I won't be uh, able to uh, sort of describe the identity-based encryption, but uh, you know, this is the basic 
So the encryption scheme, the public encryption scheme that underlies the AB. The ID is a system for Exactly. And the T is the ID? Uh, and uh, B is more or less the ID. B is, in fact, the hash of the ID. Hash of the ID. Because I need it to be uniformly random. Right? And this is good. Excellent. Okay, so let me describe the ID, right? So A is the system parameter in ID. Uh, B is the identity, more or less. Uh, R is the secret key for this identity. Okay? So then there is a question of, you know, how do I, given a B, how do I compute this R? Right? That's supposed to be hard, but that is the SIS problem, right? More or less. Right? Uh, and it turns out that you can do it if you have a trapdoor for A. Okay? So this, this, the, the master trapdoor in the system is a trapdoor for A, which is actually a short basis in this lattice lambda purple. So I define the lattice lambda purple of A, which is a set of all E, such that A times E equals zero mod Q. Right? So when I defined SIS, you know, this was essentially the lattice problem that uh, we were talking about. And the trapdoor, the master trapdoor, is a short basis for this lattice. Okay? And, and then it turns out, you know, then there's the question of how do I generate this lattice, a random lattice together with the trapdoor? And so on and so forth, and it can, you can, can be done. Um, and that gives you, I mean, there, there are a couple of algorithms that, uh, that, you need to, that I need to describe to finish the idea. One is, you know, how do I generate a random lattice together with the trapdoor? That's the master secret key public key generation. And the second is, given this master trapdoor, how do I find R, right? I mean, so these two are the things that I won't be able to talk about it, but. Okay, so this is the, and these are two encryption schemes uh, that you can construct out of Okay, so with this, uh, uh, the, really the only missing piece in the puzzle, in the, in the security uh, proof for both these schemes, is a connection between the search variant of Delta UE and the decision variant of Delta UE. Right? Because the security of both Regev and dual Regev are proven assuming that the decisional version of Delta UE is hard. And from the worst case to average case reduction, I know that the search under BV is hard, assuming that SIDP is hard in the worst case. But there is a, there is a mismatch. Right? So the next thing I'm going to show is that uh, the decisional version of the problem is no easier than the search uh, version of the problem. It's as hard as the search version of the problem. Okay, so that's the search to decision reduction. Uh, and again, what this says is that if you can, well, so if you can solve the search version of BV, then you can also solve the decisional version. It's trivial. It's completely trivial, right? Uh, what uh, the reduction says is if you can solve the other way around. If you can solve the decisional version, you can solve the search version. Okay. So how do I show this? Okay. Um, okay. So I have an oracle that solves the decisional version of the problem, and I want to solve, and I want to find the LWE secret test, solve the search version. The high-level strategy is following. It, 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 it's really sort of a, 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 a two-step approach. And the first uh, observation is that uh, the first step is that I'm going to solve, I'm going to find this vector s, L to B E vector s, piece by piece. Okay, so I'm going to find sort of the first coefficient and the second coefficient and so on and so forth. Okay, so I can, I'm going to focus on the problem of finding the first coefficient. Uh, and how do I find the first coefficient? The main the strategy here is to do a guess and check. Okay? What does guess and check mean? For each coefficient, let's say the first coefficient, I'm going to guess uh, what value it has. Okay? So I have an LWE secret, S1, S2, up to S of M. I'm going to guess what S1 is. I don't know what it is, but you know, I'm going to you know, pick a random guess. And then I'm going to use uh, the decisional LWE oracle to check that my guess is correct. You know, so I'm going to use this oracle. You know, it'll tell me, I'll show how to do this. But it'll tell me if my guess was correct or wrong. If it was correct, great, I'm done. If it was wrong, you know, go to the next guess. Right? So how many times do I have to guess? Because there are Q possible values for, uh, for the first coordinate. I need to make it at most Q guesses. So that's Q steps. For the second coordinate, I do the same thing. Okay, so another Q guesses and so on and so forth. So I need to do this basic procedure at most n times q times, okay, which is polynomial in n and q.
Okay, so how do I how do I uh, execute this uh, this strategy? Um, okay, so remember that uh, you know uh, I'm going to get many LWE samples from the search org from the for the search problem. Let's say this is an LWE sample. Um, I'm going to uh, set um, v the vector v to be the first unit vector one zero 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 and so forth. And I'm going to guess the value for v in the product with s. So what does v in the product with s? It's the first uh, coordinate of s. Right? So I'm going to guess a number g, which is what I think the first coordinate is. Then I'm going to do the following. I'm going to uh, have a procedure here, which uh, takes this sample and produces another sample. And I'm going to show the following. If my guess was correct, if g is in fact equal to you know the real value v in a product with s, then my procedure, which I'll describe here, will produce uh, an LWE distribution. Okay, I'm going to show this. I haven't shown you yet. On the other hand, if my guess was wrong, then this procedure here will produce uh, a random distribution, a random number. Okay, so now what do I do? I'm going to run this procedure. I'm going to get an LWE sample or a random sample. I don't know which is which. It depends on whether my guess is correct or wrong. I'm going to feed it to the decisional oracle. Okay? The decisional oracle will tell me, is it random or is it LWE? Okay? Depending on that, I, I will decide if my guess was correct or wrong. Okay? So this the decisional LWE oracle gives you a way to test uh, whether your guess for a coordinate is correct or wrong. So once we uh, once I describe this magic procedure which does these two things, you're done. Okay, and you know this is for the first coordinate of uh, of s. For the second coordinate, I'm going to use the vector zero one zero zero zero, so choose as the second coordinate, and so on and so forth. That uh, I'll recover all the numbers, not the best, all the numbers, all the coordinates. Okay, so how do I carry out this uh, this this strategy? Well, I'm going to take this sample and I'm going to do the following. Okay? I'm going to pick a random number r in ZQ, a totally random number. And I'm going to compute the following uh, quantity. I'm going to take A and add the random multiple of V to it. Okay? So what, is, what does this do? Uh, r times V is essentially R00000. And when I add it to A, it randomizes the first uh, coordinate of A. And the rest of it remains the same. And then I do a b plus r times my guess. Okay, that's what I'm going to do, and I get uh, you know some number here. So what do I want to prove about this number? I want to prove these two things, right? If my guess was correct, then it is an LWE distribution. If my guess was wrong, then it's a random distribution. Okay, it's a random value. Okay, why is that the case? Well, it, let's say my guess was correct. In fact, let's say g is equal to v in a product with s, then I can rewrite this number as a plus r times v, a in the product s plus e plus my guess, r times my guess, which is r times v in the product with s. Okay? So I just took this guy and substituted for g, which is a correct guess. Okay? So once I simplify this, I get this vector, a plus r v, which is a random vector because a is. And this guy in the product with s, because I combine and put these two terms uh, together, I get a plus r times v in the product s plus an error. What does this look like? It looks like an LWE sample. Right? It's a vector. It's a random vector. The random vector in the product with s plus a small error. Okay? This is another LWE sample. Okay? So bottom line, if my guess was correct, I produced the LWE distribution. So you know, I'm halfway through in my proof. The only thing I want to prove is, that, is the second part, which is uh, if, the, if my guess was wrong, then I will really produce a, a, random, uh, a random distribution. Okay, so why is that the case? If my guess was wrong, then I can write g as the correct value plus uh, a g prime, which is a non-zero number. Right? Let me do the same thing again. Let me rewrite, let me substitute uh, g into the picture. I will get exactly what I got before plus r times g prime. Okay, so this guy, the g prime was zero before because I got the correct guess in the previous case, but now it's a non-zero number. Okay, so simplify, I get exactly an LWE sample. This whole thing is an LWE sample plus a random number. 
okay, what do I, what happens if I add a fixed quantity uh, to a random quantity, I get a random quantity. Okay, so this whole thing is a random uh, number independent of S, E, and A plus R, B. Because A plus R, B, uh, given A plus R, B, you don't know what R is, because A is uniformly random, right? So this whole thing looks like uh, a, a random number. Okay, so I just executed, showed how to execute this strategy, right? I took an LWE sample, uh, I guessed the first coordinate, if my guess was correct, I got an LWE sample, guess was wrong, I got a random sample, I used the uh, decisional oracle to distinguish. Okay, so this gives me, this is, this is the search to decision reduction. Okay, it's very, very simple. So, uh, so with this, you know, we have a complete picture of uh, a secure encryption scheme based on LWE, based on search LWE, in fact, because of this reduction, which is also, by the worst case to average case reduction, it's also based on the worst case hardness of shortest independent vectors. Okay, so th this is really the only uh, crypto system that I know which is based on the worst case hardness of, uh, of some problem. Okay, that's the next feature of this scheme. Um, what, uh, what, uh, what I'm going to do in the, um, in the rest of um, this lecture and the next is uh, I'm going to describe um, uh, two, uh, two improvements to this scheme. So it turns out, and I'll tell you more about it, that this scheme is, uh, is nice and simple, but it's not as efficient as you would hope, uh, hope to be. And this was already raised uh, here somewhere, that the public key is actually large in this scheme. And as a result, the encryption and the decryption algorithms take a long time uh, to run. Okay? So it turns out that there are two ways of uh, making this scheme um, efficient. One is to um, uh, rely on the hardness of uh, a slightly different, uh, a different variant of LWE called the ring LWE. Okay? So that gives you a sort of a compact public key. It gives you an efficient uh, encryption and decryption algorithm. Uh, but it's based on a you know slightly different assumption, which also has a worst case to average case reduction. So, uh, so that's nice. Uh, the other way to get efficiency is that uh, is to sort of um, is to get sort of a, an amortized notion of efficiency, right? So I can uh, modify the scheme to another scheme which is also based on LWE, the same assumption, uh, with the guarantee that if you encrypt a lot of bits, right? Uh, the size of the ciphertext is going to be more or less proportional to the number of bits. In fact, you know, uh, as the number of uh, bits that you encrypt increases, it's k, the number of bits uh, becomes large. The size of the ciphertext becomes essentially um, a 1 plus epsilon times k, more or less the length. So to encrypt uh, a million bits, the ciphertext has size more or less a million bits. Okay, so that's the best you can do. Okay? So that's the it's sort of a different way to uh, so amount, get amortized efficiency for this game. Okay, so uh, let's. Uh, okay, so let me be a bit more specific for what I'm talking about. Uh, Lattice says, you know, great features, strong security proofs based on worst case uh, assumptions. Schemes are simple, as you saw. I mean, this is just basic linear algebra. Uh, it's relatively efficient, but the schemes have very large keys. Okay, so how large do the keys get? Uh, let's look at the hash function first. Okay, the hash function is, uh, you know, the description of the hash function is a1 up to am. These are vectors, m vectors in zq to the m. And it takes an m bit vector and, and maps it on to a vector in zq to the m. Okay, so, uh, so it's a very simple description, but how large do the keys get? Uh, the sample parameters for the scheme are, um, so this is, uh, a set of parameters for the scheme that gives you sort of a moderate level of security, at best a moderate level of security. Okay, so this is not the kind of, sort of parameters that you want to use in practice, um, but still. Uh, okay, so, so the uh, dimension n here is 64. Uh, the, the modulus q is 257, it's a prime, you know, it's a, it's a small prime. And m is bigger than n times log q, which is, uh, which turns out to be 1024. Close to 2024. 
So what what happens with uh, uh, what happens with the size of the keys in this key? The domain size is uh, 1024 bits, right? Because it's 0, 1 to the m. The range is 512 bits, right? Uh, and, uh, and that means that the scheme compresses, you know, uh, a message by a factor of five. But let's look at what the let's look at how many bits it takes to represent the function. Okay, so if this is uh, m vectors each of length uh, n times log q. m vectors from z q to the n, each vector has length n times log q. So it's m times n times log q, which is, you know, once you do the, once you do the arithmetic, it is about uh, half a megabit. Okay, so this is not, uh, you know, if you take a number theory based uh, uh, hash function, it'll have size, you know, the key will have size like uh, 4,000 bits. Uh, typically, I mean, if you use factoring, uh, or even smaller if you use a uh, discrete log based, uh, an elliptic curve based hash function. Okay, so the scheme is nice in that uh, it has uh, uh, it has very simple operations, but the keys are extremely large. Okay, so that's about the hash function. Uh, how about the public key crypto system that I described? Right. So. Uh, for, uh, for, for the RSA scheme, this is not like the secure RSA scheme, but the textbook, you know, the vanilla RSA scheme, the key is of size 2048 bits, I guess, if you want uh, 80 bit security. And the ciphertext length is also 2048 bits. Okay, so you work over uh, Z and star, where N is uh, 2048 bits. In the LWE based scheme, if you do the operation, if you do the, so the calculation, uh, the, the size of the public key, which is really the size of the matrix, which is really this big matrix A, right? That turns out to be, well, essentially the same as, uh, as here, as the description of the function here, right? Which is uh, 600,000 bits. So why is this uh, little sort of, uh, so this, is, this has a description of the matrix together with one vector, right? So it's a little bit bigger than uh, uh, before, but it's about uh, half a megabit. The ciphertext, um, if you uh, right, so so this uh, this number is uh, is even with the optimization that I'm going to talk about next. So even with this optimization, um, a 2048 bit message uh, maps to uh, a 40,000 bit um, ciphertext. Okay, um, so this is uh, you know not as efficient as uh, as you would hope. And really, the source of the efficiency is uh, is the large public key. Okay, so the public key contains this like huge matrix, um, and it, this requires order of m times n storage, which is which can get pretty long. And the key generation and encryption, the key generation and encryption are basically uh, multiplying this matrix with a vector, and that takes order of m n time. So this can get pretty cumbersome as well. Okay, this is not the le next lecture, but uh, what I want to describe next is how to uh, improve, the two ways of improving the efficiency of the basic scheme that I talked about. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to move to the whiteboard. Um, uh, this is the turning off thing, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Good.
Okay, good. So uh, what I'm going to describe is uh, two efficiency improvements. Uh, first, I will show a way to get. Um, uh, so what, what uh, the, the both the encryption schemes that I described, both the regif scheme and the dual regif scheme, encrypted one bit. Right? The ciphertext for one bit. Uh, the question is, can I actually pack many bits into the same ciphertext? So that I'm going to show. It's the first thing. Show. Sure. Um, the second scheme is another way to get efficiency based on uh, this problem called ring LWE, which is a variant of LWE, which I'll describe um, also. And the good thing about, uh, the nice thing about this uh, second way of getting efficiency is that it gives you, uh, well, two bytes in a shot, right? It gives you efficiency. And it also gives you a homomorphic encryption scheme, a somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme. And what this means, what what uh, what a homomorphic encryption scheme means, is that is that it's an encryption scheme that um, where you can take an encryption of a message X, and you can compute the encryption of f of X for a large class of functions. Now. Okay. So this is all without knowing what the message. So you don't know what the message is. The message is given to you encrypted. And you can uh, operate inside the ciphertext and compute a function. Okay. So these are the two things I'm going to show. So let's start with uh, number one. So um, call it. Let me call it amortized like it. This is something that uh, we uh, came up with in a joint work with uh, Chris Pikett and Brent Waters. Okay, so how does this work? Well, um, so let's look at um, the regular encryption scheme first, and let's see why that is actually inefficient. So there are two sources of inefficiency. And, uh, and why is it inefficient? Well, uh, the ciphertext uh, in regif looks like um, r times a, r is a vector. Public key looks like a and a s plus e. Secret key is s. And the encryption looks like r times, so let's call it b. looks like R times B plus um, the message times Q over 2. So this is what the ciphertext looks like for a message which is a bit. So, so it maps sort of one bit to how many bits does it map it to? So this guy is in ZQ to the N. So this is N log Q bits plus this guy lives in ZQ. Okay, so that's log qubits. So this is n plus one log qubits. Okay, so one bit maps to n plus one log qubits. So that's a huge, uh, huge ciphertext flaw. What we are going to do is we are going to improve uh, the scheme in two different ways. Okay, so the first thing we are going to do is we are going to um, not encrypt a single bit in the in the ciphertext, but we are going to encrypt uh, a large number. Okay, so in, in other words, um, the first um, first improvement is that I'm going to look at um, encrypting um, a number z, which comes from z b. Okay, so this is all, so all of this works uh, mod Q, right, so, so all this is mod Q, and I'm going to have, uh, so think of uh, Q as uh, uh, 257 and B as uh, uh, something like 70, okay, 71, yes. Uh, is this large? Did you call this large? 
Okay. Let me do a binary search. Okay. Is this large? <laughs> no, it's good. Uh, okay. Um, sounds good. So I'm going to encrypt uh, Z, which comes from uh, ZP. Okay. So what is P? P is not uh, 2. It's not 0, 1. It, it's, a, it's a large, uh, it's a comparatively large space. Um, and how do you how do you encrypt? You do the same thing as before. You do R times A, R times uh, B plus plus Z times Q over B. Okay. So so what red lips encryption does? Is it roughly sort of uh, you know it, it has this whole space to work with, right? I mean it has it works over z q, so it has uh, numbers from zero to q, and it says I'm going to map uh, zero to a zero, and I'm going to map one to q over two. Okay, so that's that's what I add to the ciphertext. What I want to do is I want to divide zero to q into q different into p different parts. So this is q over p, 2 times q over p, and so forth. Okay. So uh, the result is that instead of mapping a bit into the message space, I'm going to map a value in zp to the message space. Okay. So again, I'm packing more and more bits into the same place. Okay. So why does this work? It works for really the same reason as before. Uh, when I decrypt, I'm going to get uh, z times q over p, the message, plus a small error. Okay, so what is this error going to be? It's going to be the inner product of r and p. Okay, so as long as so I'm going to get really uh, the correct number, which is uh, z times q over p, plus a little perturbation. Okay, so I'm going to get a number in this. Uh, in this interval. As long as this perturbation, this sort of uh, error, is smaller than you know, q over uh, 2p, so if uh, so this is correct, I can recover the correct message. As long as uh, the error is smaller than q over 2p. Okay? So think of it this way. I have uh, the correct value z times q over p. And in decryption, I'm going to check, I'm going to get a value in this interval, and I'm going to check you know, what is the nearest multiple of q over p that this number is close to. Okay. And I get the correct answer as long as this perturbation is smaller than half the distance between you know, these two numbers, which is q over 2p. Okay. So I can pack many bits into a It's still not done. Because the improvement that we got is that we went from saying that one bit encrypts to n plus one log q bits to saying that log p bits, not encrypting one bit, I'm encrypting a number from zp. So log p bits encrypt to n plus one log q bits. Right? This is still extremely, extremely large. Okay. So. This is handled by the second improvement. Okay, so why is this uh, so large? Because we, what we did in this first improvement was we reduced the size of this component relative to the uh, size of the message that we are encrypting. But still, there is this huge sort of component of the ciphertext which just sits there. We haven't done anything to it. Right? So what we are going to do is we are going to encrypt many bits, many values in ZP, actually, while reusing this component. So I'll have this one R times A, but then I'll encrypt many, many, many bits. And this, this R times A will stay the same. Okay. So in other words, what I will show is that I will encrypt, essentially, N plus 1 
log p bits using n plus 1 n log q plus n log p bits. So in other words, this is the length of the message. I'm going to encrypt a message of this length using essentially the same length, right? roughly the same length. So if you forget about this quantity, these two guys are roughly the same if I set uh, p and q to be very close together. Okay? I can't set p and q to be arbitrarily close because then decryption will always fail because of this error. But I can set them to be uh, very close. So for example, q can be 257 and p can be um, 71. Okay? Um, this is just a sample you know, set of parameters. It probably doesn't work. The exact, exact numbers probably doesn't, don't work, but uh, this is the kind of thing that we want. Okay. So think of setting, you know, in general, think of setting, uh, think of P being roughly square root Q. Okay. In that case, what we are doing here is we are encrypting half n log Q bits to n log Q plus n log Q, which is 2 n log Q bits. So in other words, the message expansion, right? So we took a message of a certain length, and the ciphertext is four times the length of the message. Okay, this is far better than what we uh, what we had in the beginning. Okay, so how is it? How are we going to do it? So this is the second improvement. The idea is to reuse this R times example. So the new scheme works in the following way. The secret key will not be a single LWE secret. It will be um, essentially will be a bunch of LWE secrets, K secrets. Uh, the public key is going to be A together with AS1 plus E1 up to ASK plus EK. Right? So I'm doing, uh, uh, I'm doing this modification at the cost of increasing the public key. Public key doesn't increase by too much, right? Because to uh, uh, encrypt sort of k messages all at once, I am only adding sort of one vector, you know, for every sort of k. So if I, uh, if you think of a as a matrix in Z Q to the m by n, um, if I set k to be equal to n, I am only adding another matrix in Z Q to the m by n. So I'm only increasing the public key by a factor of two. And uh, what I get out of it is that I will um, essentially be able to um, encrypt, you know, k bits, uh, k uh, elements from uh, ZQ, uh, ZP, uh, using four times uh, that many bits. Yeah. So, so square root of Q, think of uh, square root of Q as kind of a sample, you know. Uh, so it depends on how much the error grows, right? Um, so. If the, um, say that again, what is the optimal value? It's a, it's a, it's a, I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, it depends on, so this is, so in general, choosing parameters for this large space cryptography is, is not, is not like choosing parameters for number theory based systems. Right? Number theory based systems, you have one number. You have the length of the module, so 2048, and you're done. But here you have to choose the dimension, you have to choose the modulus, you have to choose you know how large the error is, right? Um, and it's and things get a bit complicated here because the larger you set the p to be, the larger the number of bits you try to pack, and the smaller you have to set the uh, LWE error, right? So so your LWE error is something, and I have to I have to set this to be smaller than q over two p for decryption to succeed. What happens when I set the LWE error to be small? I make the assumption easier, right? So the error is smaller, therefore it's easier to break. And therefore I have to set the security parameter to be larger, right? So the whole thing comes back again. So it's it's not very uh, it's not completely clear how to choose uh, this parameter. It depends on 
you have to analyze these things for specific numbers. So I don't know what uh, the answer is. No, no, it doesn't have to be. B can be any number, but Q is uh, Q's prime. OK, so thinking, thinking of it asymptotically, the, what this choice means is that I can sort of uh, encrypt you know, half log qubits using log qubits. Right? I can encrypt a number in square root q, 0 to square root q, using uh, a number from 0 to q. Uh, OK, so this is the public key. What is the encryption? So th the message is now going to be um, m1 up to m sub k. This is this lives in zp to the k. Okay, so each of these, each of, I'm going to take my message, split it up into uh, k numbers. Each one lives in uh, zp. Okay, so this is going to be r times a. So I choose a single r and compute r times a. And let me call this b1, b2 up to bk, the same as uh, before, except that it's k copies. So now I'm going to compute r in a product with b1 plus uh, m1 times q over p, r b2 plus m2 times q over p, and so forth. OK, the point is that you know these, these are numbers, OK? So I'm going to, for each uh, coordinate of the message, I'm going to have a new uh, ciphertext value here. But these are numbers, they're small numbers. The point is that I'm going to use this guy, the same guy, to encrypt all these uh, ciphertexts. So I'm reusing this component of the ciphertext. Right. Uh, and now let's calculate the length of the, of the ciphertext. I'm encrypting uh, k times log p bits. This is the length of the message. Into uh, a ciphertext. You know, how long is the ciphertext? This guy lives in zq to the n. So this is n log q bits. Plus, there are k numbers here. Each, uh, each one lives in um, zq. So it's n plus k log qubits. Okay. So now um, let, let me set uh, p to be square root q as before. And let me set k to be equal to n. Okay. So what I did was I, I can set k to be as large as I want, right? Because this is, you know, it's a parameter of the system. So now I encrypted n log uh, half n log q uh, bits to um, two times n log q bits of the ciphertext. So this is the length of the message. This is the length of the ciphertext. Okay. So. You know, rather than a huge message expansion that we had before, now the ciphertext only expands by a factor of uh, four. And I can actually make this smaller and smaller by increasing k to be uh, larger and larger. Okay, so I can make this number four as close to one as I want. Okay, so this is uh, one way to make this scheme efficient in the sense that the ciphertext is not too much larger than the message. Okay, but still the public key in the system is still pretty large. In fact, in fact, I took the public key that was there before, and I actually increased uh, the length of the public key. I didn't do anything to, to mitigate that, that problem. Right. So the main sort of point of this, uh, this improvement is that it reduces the length of the cycle. It reduces the ciphertext expansion. OK, so this is, uh, OK, good. So this is the the first scheme, the first way to improve the efficiency of Rugged's encryption scheme. So uh, any questions? I can uh, increase k beyond n. Yes, I can do that. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, the more I increase it, um, uh, the lesser the message expansion becomes. So I can make this message expansion. So this is now 4. I can make it very close to 1. I can make it 1 plus epsilon. Okay. And the, the, the effect, obviously, you know, there's no free lunch, right? I mean, I pay for it somewhere. And the place I pay for it is in the size of the public. Okay. Make k larger, the public key becomes larger. Okay. So this is the this is the first way to improve uh, racket encryption. Okay. So let me. So we're 
close at two percent. So what I would, let me do the, the following. Let me describe. Let me start describing uh, the second improvement to Rigel, namely uh, a scheme based on the ring LWE problem. Um, and I'll define what ring LWE is, and maybe we can take a break and uh, continue. Um, continue after this. So the second way to do this is based on ring LWE. Ring LWE is a problem uh, defined by um, LPR, Lubashevsky, Piker to Dragon. And what this um, what this problem says is the following. Okay, so it's 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 defined in a very similar way to LWE. Um, it um, it talks about the modulus. The parameters of this uh, assumption are the modulus Q, um, an irreducible should I even talk about okay then. irreducible polynomial f of x think of it as x to the x to the n plus 1 so dimension n power of 2. Okay, so the parameters of this uh, assumption, oh, bigger. All right, this is uh, a chronic problem. Uh, all right. Bigger. Okay, so you have uh, a dimension n, which is a power of 2. So, n is 2 to the k for some k. You have a modulus um, q, uh, which satisfies some constraints, but never mind what they are. Uh, and then you have uh, an irreducible uh, polynomial. Irreducible over the uh, integers. Polynomial. I'm going to set this polynomial to the to be x to the n plus one. Okay, so x to the n if n is a power of two, x to the n plus one uh, turns out to be irreducible. And my problem says the following: I have a box as I did before. The box now contains uh, S, which is um, so S is a random uh, polynomial. of degree um, n minus 1 over zq. Okay, so s is a polynomial, variable x, and it is, uh, you can write this as s0, the constant term, plus s1 times x, s2 times x squared, and so forth up to s n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1. So it's a degree n minus 1 polynomial over zq. So each of these coefficients come from zq. Okay, so that's what s is. In fact, you know, structurally, if you just look at it, it is no different from a vector because I can write this uh, polynomial as a vector of its coefficients. So it's just the same thing as before, except that I'm interpreting this vector as a polynomial. So again, there is this. Uh, red button here, and uh, when I press it, what I get is a sample of the form A, which is a random polynomial, again, so A is a random polynomial in ZQ of X mod X to the N plus 1. So what this means is the set of, this, this is the set of all polynomials whose coefficients are in ZQ. And this is saying that you know if you have a polynomial with degree larger than n, larger than or equal to n, reduce it modulo x to the n plus one. Okay, so that's what it says. So A is a random polynomial of degree n minus one with coefficients in ZQ, the same as S. And E is a small it's a polynomial with small coefficients, degree n minus one polynomial 
with small coefficients. How small? It's a parameter of the system. What is the exact distribution of this E? It's also a parameter of the system. But so far, you know, so far, just think of it as a uh, as a follow me with small coefficients. What this box gives you when you press a button is it gives you a, this random A together with A times S plus E. Of course, all of this is taken mod Q and x to the n plus 1. Okay. When I do A times S, A and S are polynomials of degree n minus 1. If I multiply these two guys, I'll get a polynomial of a larger degree, right? 2 times n minus 2. I'm going to reduce it modulo x to the n plus 1 to bring it back down to degree uh, n minus 1. Then I'm going to add uh, an error polynomial. Okay, it's a small coefficient. Okay. So this is structurally, it is the same as LWE, except that I'm working with polynomials instead of, uh, so I'm working with sort of polynomial multiplication instead of an inner product of factors. Okay. So what is the difference between this and, so in terms of uh, quality, what's the difference between this and LWE? Uh, in LWE, you know, for every sample that I get, I get a, a number <coughs> a in a product s plus e. Okay, so this is a number in, in ZQ. Okay, I get a single number in ZQ, and the decisional WE problem says that assumption says that this is too random, right? right? So this number I can't tell if it's random or an WE instance. What ring WE says, so this is LWE, this is ring WE. What ring WE says is that Every time I press a button, I get a polynomial which is supposed to, which is supposed to look uh, indistinguishable from random. Okay, so the assumption says that this guy looks computationally indistinguishable <coughs> from random. So for every press of a button, I get many random numbers. So n random numbers here instead of one random number here. Okay, so it gets more pseudorandomness out of the same uh, sort of, uh, work. Okay, so you can you can uh, define sort of a decision version, a search version, the same thing as before. You know, either find the polynomial S or distinguish these samples from random, and you can prove them to be equivalent for some choice of parameters. Never mind what they are, uh, and you can also show a worst case to average case reduction. So you can solve this problem. If you have an oracle that solves the ring LWE problem, you can solve uh, uh, the SIVP problem on a class of lattices. Okay, no class of lattices called ideal lattices. Never mind what they are. We're going to sort of work with this, uh, uh, this problem to construct a uh, more efficient crypto system. OK, so um, let me actually tell you what the system is. Okay, so we're going to construction of the crypto system. It doesn't have to be. Um, so the nice thing about, I, I don't want to get into too much details, but the nice thing about x to the n plus 1, when n is a power of 2, is that it's a cyclotomic. It's what's called a cyclotomic polynomial. And never mind what that is. I mean, if you, if you have heard about it, great. If you haven't heard about it, no problem, right? Uh, and this has nice properties, right? So uh, in particular, the search to decision reduction works only for cyclotomic polynomials. It doesn't matter, you know, just think about it as, for our purposes, it doesn't matter what this polynomial is. Okay? Uh, X to the n plus 1? Uh, it's good for efficiency. It's not clear if it's good for security, right? Because you're, you're tying yourself down to uh, one, uh, one choice of the polynomial, right? So it's not clear that it's good for security. It's good for efficiency because uh, it turns out that you can implement multiplication of two polynomials, mod x to the n plus 1, very efficiently. You can use sort of the fast Fourier transform type of techniques to do this very, very fast. Because it's good for efficiency. OK, so, uh, so how do you construct? Uh, so the main point of uh, uh, this construction is that I'm going to show how to um, reduce the public key. Uh, from this m times n, from this huge public key that we had before, to something a lot smaller. Okay, that's the point. And you know, on top of it, uh, you know, I don't get 
I don't just get efficiency, I'm going to get a homomorphic encryption scheme, a somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme out of this. Okay, so, uh, so the system from uh, ring of WV. Okay. So let's uh, let's warm up. Okay. So let's first construct a very very simple symmetric encryption scheme, secret key encryption scheme from uh, LWV, ring LWV. The way it works is the following. Okay, so it, you know, if you look at, if you think about the, if I tell you the LWE, ring LWE problem, it's immediate. It's, it's obvious how to construct a, a symmetric encryption scheme. And the way it works is the following. The secret key is S, the secret of the ring LWE system. Uh, I want to encrypt, let's say, um, a, a polynomial M. Okay? So M is a polynomial with, um, uh, coefficients in ZQ, in, Z, uh, in ZP, let's say. So the P is the same P as what we, what we had over there. The encryption is really, it's A times S plus error. Okay, so this is exactly a ring LWE sample. Plus, I'm going to use this to mask, I'm going to pick a random A, I'm going to use this to mask the um, the message. Okay, so this is these two together form a ring of WE sample. And I'm going to add the message times Q over P to uh, to the sample. Okay, so this is the encryption. That's it. How do you decrypt? Well, uh, the decryption algorithm gets uh, the secret key, right? So it computes uh, A times S plus E plus M Q over P minus A, which it has, times S, which is really the message plus a small error. Okay? By the same argument as before, if the error is smaller than Q over 2P, I can actually reconstruct each coefficient of the message independently. Okay? So that's, the, that's a symmetric, symmetric encryption scheme uh, from bring okay? it's, it's, it's It's very simple. Uh, to encrypt a message uh, from uh, ZP to the N, I, my vector lies in, uh, my ciphertext lies in ZQ to the N. So essentially you can, uh, so this gives you a ciphertext expansion of 2. Okay, if, uh, if P equals uh, square. Same parameters as before, you get a ciphertext expansion of, of 2. And uh, I haven't told you uh, what uh, the public key encryption scheme is, which I'll describe next. The public key turns out to be um, two polynomials uh, from ZQ of X modifiers. Okay? So each polynomial I need n log qubits to represent. So the public key is two times n log qubits. Whereas before, the public key was m times n log qubits. It's n squared times log qubits. Now it's uh, n log qubits, which is n log q is, uh, is more like 10,000 bits as opposed to 500,000 bits. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's an order, it's a, it's a couple of orders of magnitude improvement in the size of the public. Okay, so I'll describe the public encryption scheme next, and I'll show why the scheme is uh, homomorphic. Okay, so that's the plan for um, the next and the last lecture, and maybe we can take a break. Uh, for, I mean,